Welcome to UCF Nightline, your source for UCF sports and former player information. Hello, Night Nation. This is Andrew Fagley coming to you from the 1148 studios. This is episode number 52. Joining me in studio is... Trace Trulko. Hello, everyone. Sorry about my voice. It's a little rough today because I did a lot of yelling yesterday. It, um, yeah. 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 A lot of things to yell to about. Say. It's, uh, I think we need to get a sponsorship from a funeral home if the season's going to continue like this because it is hard to get excited and motivated to talk about uh, the debacle that was that loss. Or an alcohol company like, you know, Jameson or, <laughs> you know, I'll mention some names, you know. Uh, I'm not much Jose of a drinker. Cuervo. I'm not much of a drinker. Perhaps I should be if I'm going to continue to watch this Maybe team something play. something a little stronger. But this is a day, as we record this, where I feel hungover. A moonshine company <laughs> would be even better. Somebody that makes some moonshine. I feel hungover from this. I I feel worse than I did after the FIU loss, which oh, stunned me. Yeah, I mean, of course, that's that that loss was nothing compared to this. This is a an FCS team that we just we just get lost to an FCS team. A few numbers here, real quick, off the top. UCF holds on to an zero and three record for the first time since two thousand four. How'd that year turn out? I I don't even remember. But that two, was the O four. Yeah. Year. So 2004 is what we're, we're comparing this to. Saturday marked the UCF's first loss as an FBS school to an FCS school since it joined the FBS in 1996. It was 20 and 0 before Saturday's defeat. So it's a throwback Saturday. We've gone back in time 20 years <laughs> as a program. And Furman holds the lead in our meetings. Two to nothing. You know, we um, we spoke with the Furman Insider last week, and we kind of got more, a chuckle though. out of that. There's more. That he said that they held the all-time lead, and we thought, okay, that was interesting, but not that would end. Yeah. <laughs> UCF lost back-to-back -back home games for the first time since 2008. In what I would say, for me, is the worst home loss we've ever had. Ever. I mean, ever. 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 Yes. Yeah, ever. Yeah. And I date back to the early 90s as a student. Right. I've never saw anything like that. At home, we lost. We had such a great record going that it was being mentioned in the national, you know, polls as far as our home, you know, win-loss. Mm -hmm. We were in the top 10, I believe. Yeah, we, we locked things down at home. Yeah. Not anymore. That's no. done. It's over. It's, it's sick. It is absolutely sick. I won't even joke about our predictions of just three weeks ago, <laughs> by the way, three games ago, when what'd you say, ten and two? I said nine and three. These things are kind of out the window now. Um, I honestly think that it couldn't even be two and ten at this point. Well, I don't think on. we're going to win another if game. If you look at the schedule, and if you say a home win at Conference USA doormat FIU and FCS Furman, those are two of the gimmies on the schedule. Well, that's why they're the non-conference in the in the beginning of the of the season because they're supposed to be the. So where are the wins on the schedule? But there's make, none. Make there's fun none if you want any. of UConn in maybe, a couple of weeks. Maybe, 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 maybe we could beat Tulane. Make fun of UConn if you want in a couple of weeks. They lost nine to six at number twenty-two Missouri. Oh, I know. By the way, we didn't lose by three points at Missouri last year. Right. We we got beat up pretty bad by like twenty. So let's yeah. not make fun of of UConn and say that's a gimme uh, win. Uh, Tulane, okay. Uh, there, there's not six wins with this team the way it's playing now that has any consideration for bowl eligibility. I don't think it's just the team. I don't think it's just the football team. I think the whole program is a debacle. Well, that's a strong statement. It's true because I don't know if George O'Leary is not focusing on coaching football, focusing on the AD job, but I don't think he should have either one of them next year. And I don't think Brent Key should be the offensive coordinator for anything but a high school team. Whoa. I will say that. Because I've seen better high school games called than anything that has happened so far this year for UCF, by far. Anything in particular there that you didn't like? The same play over and over <laughs> and over again that doesn't work. Running the ball with Nick Patty up the middle, up the middle, up the middle, that worked maybe the first two or three times. 
maybe four times, but then trying to do it over and over again, and it didn't work, and then not abandoning it until, so, like, the end. So last week at Running Stanford. Taj McGowan, the same play, the same play, the same play. It's just ridiculous. This program is more than that. It should be more than that. Well, it maybe should it be It doesn't more. matter if it has to be dumbed down a little bit for the, for the freshman quarterbacks. I understand that. But, come on. If an FCS team can come in here and beat our offense like that, that's bad. I mean, it's, if George O'Leary was not the AD, there would be serious talk about firing him right now. I really believe that. Uh, that's not happening. In a lot, so, I know that's not I mean, going to happen. Not happening. But in a lot of, of other systems, if that would have happened, if the same thing would have happened, you lost your first FCS game at home since being in the, you know, since whatever, how many years it was, 20 games. A lot of other coaches at a lot of other programs would have been on definitely on the hot seat. I'm sure that coaches have been fired for the same exact thing. I think he's lost control. That's just is this opinion. a little reactionary? I mean, yes, things have not gone well. Of the well. last three weeks, this is a reactionary, absolutely. So a week ago, we, in that Stanford we, game. Remember, we, we were reloading, not rebuilding. Oh, well, that's long gone. Right? Yeah, long, yeah. That's well, long gone. <laughs> so everything that the national experts, besides us, Phil Steele said they were reloading, not rebuilding. Yeah, he was wrong, too. Yeah, everybody's been yeah, wrong. Everybody's so, wrong. So... So, so what we talked about on the Stanford game is that in no way, shape, or form did the game plan call for four quarterbacks, right? I mean, that's safe. We, we don't expect Justin Holman to go out. We're not going to play four quarterbacks as we did. That's not the game plan. It certainly seems that the game plan was to play three quarterbacks against uh, Definitely. <laughs> right? But, but I expected that. I expected three. I expected three because you knew that they were going to run the wild night crap at some point you mean one or two times not right but i mean whatever over and over and but over I, and i also expected to see both bo schneider and tyler harris i think that was a given i don't think that was a surprise to anyone i think seeing tyler harris for so long maybe was you know a surprise to some people and what did we learn about these two quarterbacks i like bo schneider a lot better than tyler harris i always have and i i it still it seems getting, to have the stronger arm. It keeps getting proven over and over again. He makes the better, Bo Snyder makes the better decisions out there. Yes, he threw an interception, which was the wide receiver's fault for not knocking that ball away and being in the spot that he needed to be in because Bo Snyder threw that ball exactly where that receiver was supposed to be, and he wasn't there. If you're And he should have knocked the ball away. If your goal by playing those two quarterbacks is to give them reps, right, and give them game exposure that they much need against a Furman, wasn't there an over-reliance on this uh, wild night then? Did we need to do that that we're, many we're, times? We're desperate. We're abs- that's desperation right there. And I know you've got freshman quarterbacks, but this happens at other programs in the country, and they don't look as befuddled and lost as our I would like does. to you know, look back and see you know, how many FBS teams have been beaten by FCS teams in this fashion, you know, after whatever, I mean, there's there's lots of injuries. I talked last week about yeah. how Aikens should not be back there, you know. I, you said it last week, and you've been saying it touchdowns. for weeks that you thought it was a mistake. And Case in point, because I think that, I don't know, we haven't heard anything yet, but from what I saw on the replays of that, I came home and immediately went to the ESPN, watch ESPN app on my computer and, and watched that knee and it's tough Four to watch. Five times. Uh, oh, it's horrible. I, I just horrible. saw that replay yeah. now for I just the first time, it and it's tough to watch. Yeah. He, his career could be over, to be honest with you, with that type of situation, with his knee going. His, his you know leg went one way, his knee went the other way, which it wasn't supposed to go. It went sideways. That situation notwithstanding, he plays, is not hurt. Is this a different game because he's in? I don't know about the, that. Those no. quarterbacks play better. The, the running game they, is better. It may be because there was another threat that people knew about there. That's the thing. People game plan around certain players, and they may have game plan to, to shut Aikens down if they could have. I mean, I, I'm not sure the exact statistics, but we were near the bottom of the, all of the rankings in offense. I don't know that the outcome of that. The outcome may have changed. Maybe we win the game, but offensively. Well, week one we had two wide receivers with both 101, 109 yards. 104. Or whatever. Nine catches each. Yeah. So 36 points in three games. Yeah. 
It's it's ridiculous. It, this is absolutely and let's talk ridiculous. about let's talk about these fifteen points. Uh, one of which was a safety. So t- I mean, two points was a safety. Um, a turnover by Furman. UCF could only pick up three points on. Right. Yeah. So the missed opportunity to get seven when you're down around the twenty yard line on that turnover. Uh, so missed opportunity there to get more points a week ago on the Stanford game. I was very critical of this fourth and nine play call. Well, here we have another one critical of the fourth and nine play call with Bo Schneider. I, you know, I understand where they were on the field and all of that, but I didn't like that play call. So we get to a fourth and two at the 25. Okay. We're up 12, nothing in this game and they go for it and they fail, which I, right there, you shouldn't fail on a fourth and two at home against Furman. All right. right. So let's just say that that shouldn't happen. But Coach O'Leary's justification for the week one 47 yard kick at the end of the game that would have given UCF the lead against FIU. His words were that it was a chip shot for his kicker. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So the ball now is at the 25 on a fourth and two. A field goal. We don't know that it'll be successful. College kids. You don't know. But could give you a 15 0 lead. Did you see the field goal that the guy from Furman kicked? (laughs) 55 yards. I didn't I expect believe. to see him come 55 out. 55 yards, if I'm not mistaken. That was a long, long, well, long, long. Before field we get goal. to that, and I have a point on that, why don't you attempt that field goal, fourth and two at the 25? Because exactly you're kicker, my reasons why Brent Key should not be the offensive coordinator. I may be mistaken and maybe on this. George O'Leary has lost whatever he had. Because I'm still a little bit mentally hung over from this experience. But our strong-legged kicker on the on the kickoff kicks the ball out of bounds, right? Mm-hmm. That leads, doesn't it, down the line to that Furman? I think that was when the Furman had the 55-yard yeah, field I don't goal. Know. I'm not sure. I, I stopped. You know who there. the MVP is after three weeks? Look, That's Caleb Powell. Yeah, the most punter. valuable punter. The punter is our most valuable <laughs> He's player. The most valuable player. On the team. It's ridiculous. So what did... Um, Nothing against Caleb Houston. He's a great punter. He, yeah, no, he's he done does a great, great job. job. He's done a great job. But that's ridiculous yeah. that your punter is the best player on your team. He's done a great job. What did, uh, what did Coach O'Leary... I don't even have to listen to the soundbite. I haven't heard it. I don't, well, even, he did nothing, I don't even have to listen to it, but I'm sure that there is not going to be anything in that soundbite that's accountable about offensive game plan and play call. Yeah, and is I, there anything I, in there about that? There's No. Of course not. Somebody did ask him at some point at the end if he wanted to take any plays back. And, you know, uh, you know it got kind of weird. And, and I'm sure that that person won't be in the, in the press conference next, <laughs> Retaliation. Week, next week. 99% sure that that person won't, won't be there. But he honestly takes no responsibility. He puts it all on the players. And I don't, I don't understand that. If you do ask him a question, which nobody does most of the time, a, a true question that would actually, you know, make him have to actually answer for something, he won't answer it. And, and th- that's why those people aren't allowed that would ask the actual questions in there. It's unbelievable. Here's what he had to say. This is his opening statement after the game. Well, obviously a tough game. I, I you know, positive part of it. I thought defensively kept us in the game as far as making plays they made and. He just can't turn the ball over four times with three interceptions, a fumble, and uh, even at the end of the game there and stuff. And uh, that's what's disappointing. And just got to regroup and continue working. As I told the players, you know, you lose, you win, lose together as a team. And obviously, uh, no one's as disappointed as I am. But uh, you know, we got to improve. You can't be dropping balls. You can't be fumbling. You can't be turning the ball over out there. And that. That's what the problem is right now as far as today's night anyway, as far as the game's concerned. I think there's quite a few people that are more disappointed than he is, probably. I know a lot of fans that are very, very disappointed, probably more than he is, to be honest with you. So I don't, I don't think that that's a correct statement by him, for one. You're not big on him today, are you? I'm not big on him unless he's producing a winning program. That's what his job is. That's what he gets paid millions of dollars to do. All right, can I be devil's advocate? Sure. Now, um, nine seniors, one of the youngest teams coming back, and you find a program that doesn't have some ups and downs and some rebuilding. Uh, you've seen that most recently with the University but he's of Florida's supposed to be program. The, he's supposed to be the master of that. But they've had a consistent run for several years and now. now it's over. Things have not started well. And I'm not just trying to 
to you know blow smoke I, I think our fans are you know are tuned in and smarter than that but teams have ups and downs and when you go back to the last campaign which to me that point where we had the 15 nothing home loss uh, to end the season at you with, with uab was the worst loss i'd ever seen so this has now gotten worse uh, what they well, built the out of that last season and what then they FIU. built out of that though what they built out of that season was uh the winningest for your senior class in program history. So, you know. But this goes farther than that, though. This goes into recruiting and everything else. Because, but teams have ups and downs. Yeah, but we're not, we're not expecting that up and down here. It's just not something that's expected from this team. So it happens. This program, I should it say. It happens. It does happen, but it's still not okay. I, I'm not I'm suggesting concerned. that it's okay. But, you know, back when the Orlando Cubs were in town, and if you follow minor league baseball anywhere, you hear the phrase, the stars of tomorrow today, and that's the way you sell the future of the program. We're seeing a lot of pieces that could be pivotal in future seasons now, a Taj McGowan, uh, a Tristan Payton. We talked about these guys months ago as being future stars for this team, and they're out there now. Uh, you know, thrown to the wolves. One of the biggest problems that I have for this is this, when when conferences look for realignment, I think this is going to be a big issue. No, I, do. I disagree. I do. No, I think that's nonsense. I do. Because... This, this has never been about whether UCF goes to a Fiesta Bowl in the eyes of a major conference, Big 12. It is about season ticket sales and booster dollars. You think this is going to help season not, ticket I'm sales? I'm not saying it's going to help it, but all of... Th- Attendance went down after the Fiesta Bowl year. Attendance because they went raised down. the ticket prices oh, again and again and again. They didn't raise the ticket prices after the Fiesta Bowl year. They raised the ticket prices this year. This year, are you raised, sure about that? This year they raised the ticket. I prices. think mine first went up. time they raised the ticket prices since they moved into Bright House. This year, attendance went down following the Fiesta Bowl, and we're going to make a bunch of excuses about we had a lot of noon games on Saturdays, and fans don't like going to the the Big Twelve is not making a decision or any other conference the based not, upon it's not only an about... 0-3 start to the 2015 season. That is not why we will or will not get into a BCS I don't, conference. No, no, no. It's not just about the 0-3 start. It's about the quality of the program. The program is, is what needs to be quality. I get that. But three weeks ago on overtime, you were saying we were going to reload. I mean, you're here predicting 10 wins. So we've not. The I wasn't the only that. one that said that. I get that. And the team hasn't Bill met Steele those ex- said that as well. That's fine. And the team hasn't met those expectations. But three weeks ago, you weren't saying that this was the end of because the world. Because that was three weeks ago before three losses so, that we should never have had. I got you We should on have that. had maybe one loss. In but that. you're throwing the entire program out now. This year was a big year. This was a huge year. As far as these things, you know, falling into place, we needed to show that we could reload versus laying down and and not having the team that we should have had this year. In other universities, in other, you know, big, you know, Power Five, whatever, you know, there's way too much emphasis put on the freaking Power Five. But anyway, I guess because we're not a part of that. But if these things happen, you lose to an FCS team like we did there's big repercussions for, you know, I, I'm sure, I don't know, is, is Stansberry in Oregon laughing now or, or what? <laughs> Did he get out at exactly the right time? You talk about repercussions. What will change in the next seven days going into that South Carolina Absolutely game? Absolutely nothing. What from a program standpoint will Absolutely change? Absolutely nothing. Maybe, maybe Coach O'Leary will put a little bit of confidence in some of his guys and, and allow them to have some starting spots and not, oh, I'm going to play one quarterback, one half. I'm going to play another one in the middle. And and maybe there can be some consistency with a quarterback that could help tremendously. In my opinion, you can't not win at any level of football without a strong quarterback. Somebody needs to be in there and getting the reps period. Not this guy, this half, this guy, that half, I'm going to pull you just because you, you did this, you know, whatever. It can't work like that. You, that it does not allow anybody to build any confidence, period, as but, a quarterback. But go into the South Carolina game. How many quarterbacks do you think you see in that game? Three, again. I hope one, to be honest. Maybe two with, with Patty coming in there. I hope in the press conference, I, I didn't play all of it because, it, you know, a lot of it's 
nonsense, to be honest with you, but one of the first, actually the first question I think that was asked after his opening statement there was that, you know, I thought about playing the entire freaking thing. I thought about this game would be a time to play the entire eight minutes of his entire press conference. Oh, goodness. But don't, I didn't. Don't, don't subject I didn't, fans yeah, to that. No. <laughs> you can find that on Rivals.com yeah, you if you want that. to. And, and Brandon does a wonderful job of getting that stuff, does a wonderful job of, of going there and, and making that available to the people that pay for it. But somebody did ask, it was Shannon Owens Green, and she asked if this is going to continue with you know having three quarterbacks, and she asked that question. I will give her props for asking that question. He said, no, I'm going to go back to one guy. Hopefully, Holman will be back, is what he said. Yeah, he seems That's not going to happen. Keep leaving the door That's not open gonna happen. for that. Yeah. It'll be interesting when uh, former UCF quarterback Kyle Israel joins the podcast in a few moments, uh, his breakdown on uh, on the Furman game, and, and in particular, when you get a chance to ask him about what he saw from the quarterback play. But uh, I don't know. Will anything change? I know you're calling. I, I know you're upset, and I know you're calling for for change what change what is going to change in a week uh i don't know nothing. i don't know what can change in a week and i don't think like we we said there nothing is probably going to change except maybe like i said a little bit of confidence that, he, that can be given to some players i really believe though we are seeing now during a rough stretch some guys that will be talented players for ucf absolutely. down the line absolutely I mean, Absolutely. you've been a big fan of Bo Schneider. I still have a lot of confidence in him. I'm concerned that he doesn't look stronger uh, and that he's not better prepared for with a playbook and for an FCS opponent. But if he would have been able to get out there and play both halves, he would have probably had some more confidence going into the second half. Yes, he threw an interception, and we talked about that, I believe, already. But... There were some brilliant throws that he had. There was one over the middle that was just a rocket, and it was in the exact right spot. It was a beautiful throw. It's probably one of the best throws that I've seen anybody make around here since Blake Bortles has been gone, to be honest with you. It was a beautiful throw. There was there was multiple ones, but the one that I remember was, was right in the middle. I, I don't remember who it was thrown to because, you know, there's so many – new wide receivers and everything else out there it gets kind of confusing sometimes i haven't i still haven't learned you know just by looking at somebody who it is i I had to actually look over and over you know it it's not the end of the world this is not the end of the world but it's it's this was a big season that's i'm going to keep saying that and everybody knows that ticket sales are going to go down you know they are i don't know how you sell this mess yeah that stadium is going to be not empty but you know it's not going to be You've heard the phrase, uh, you can put a lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Yeah. Yeah, this is still an 0-3 team with two home losses to FIU you were, and Furman. You were sitting on the east side looking at the west side. What did the west side look like? Was it full? Uh, I think they puffed with the announced crowd of 36,000, especially during the week said, when they 36? were saying that there were 39 sold. Uh uh, it seems that with it being family weekend, a number of students uh, that would normally have been in the student section sat with family right. members uh, in the opposite end zone. So that was a fuller area. Uh, no, the uh, your side of the stadium there always looks fuller than the uh, was, opposite side. Honestly, I looked up, you know, it was probably going into the second half, and I looked up and I was like, wow, you know, the east side was was fairly full i mean you know except for like the corner between the the, where the east side starts and the students and then the east side club of course those seats are always empty now because everybody's sitting in the or standing at the rail or whatever where you can see probably maybe 150 people along that rail but there's all kinds of seats up at the top which i think that thing is ridiculous and it looks horrible and whatever how do you think those people feel about paying nine hundred dollars for <laughs> yeah. their seats? It, they're paying for the now. experience, Andrew. They're not paying for yeah. the quality. Of the I team. wouldn't go there if it was given to me. Props to Furman. Uh, they brought quite a few fans who uh, were very nice people. Uh, the number thing, of them that I spoke with. Their, and... their band blew our band away, and they were like a third of the size, if that. I actually sat and watched the bands. Believe it or not, I do that. <laughs> Come on, it's just—it's an embarrassment. <laughs> the whole thing. I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed that we go there and we wear our UCF gear and we sit there and we cheer and we scream and yell. And this is the, the this is what we get back for doing that. Yeah, you know, embarrassed. That's an interesting word because uh, I'm going to the Jags game 
to watch Blake yeah, and today. I asked and you, you asked me if I'm wearing my UCF. Yeah, uh, you're, you're garb. wearing a total. You, you don't have any <laughs> Jags stuff no, on. I'm you don't have any today. UCF. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I just don't feel like you have a Blake it. Bortles jersey. No, my my five is uh, Rocky Ross. Okay, well, so that's my five. Everybody thinks, yeah, that, yeah I know, but yeah. He, that one's uh, Rocky a Rocky Ross, Ross uh, jersey. I don't want to talk about it today with random people. Well, and by the way, I'm just, sure you're going to. Yeah, I know. Well, my friends will razz me. Uh, I got phone blowed up with people going, "Really, Furman?" You know, we ridiculous. all got that. I'm sure Absolutely UCF fans ridiculous. all across the country got the same. Um, by by the way, the one of the things you'll be missing. By not going to that Jags game, you ready? The, the, the band, the band is yeah, playing. Yeah. The UCF band is playing. At I knew you would like that. What a joke! Five questions with an insider, getting to know this week's opponent. UCF hits the road, looking to avoid a zero for September start Saturday at noon at South Carolina. Joining us now to preview the Gamecocks is Scott Hood of the rival site GamecocksCentral.com. Scott, how are you doing today? Glad to be with you. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been a rough start for South Carolina, of course, following a 52-20 loss at Georgia. The Gamecocks are now 0-2 and in the SEC and 1-2 and overall. What went wrong in Athens? Well, a lot of things, uh, unfortunately, for, for the Gamecocks, uh, particularly on the defensive end. You know, uh, John Hoke. Uh, was brought in as the new uh, co-defensive coordinator and then the chief uh, defensive play caller. But uh, so far this year, many of the same problems that plagued the Gamecock defense last year, you know, lack of uh, pass rush, a lack of uh, inability to stop the run uh, along the defensive front seven, um, those problems have, have cropped up again. You know, uh, the first three opponents have all rushed for more than 200 yards against the Gamecocks. Uh, they can't seem to pressure the quarterback. Last night they had no sacks, no quarterback pressures. Which, uh, in my opinion, uh, led to uh, the Georgia quarterback having a pretty phenomenal night. And it was 24, 25 passing, which I think set a new, uh, school completion, uh, percentage record, if not an NCAA record. Was, and, uh, so, uh, if you just had, he sat back in the pocket all night and had plenty of time to throw. And, um, unfortunately, that's, uh, that's really resembled a lot of the problems they had, uh, had last year. So, um, right now, the, the, the defense, um, and, Certainly not improved a, a whole lot from last season um, when they had one of the worst years in school history. So unless USC can get the, can get that side of the ball on track, uh, it's going to be another long season uh, here in Columbia. You know, right now if you look at their schedule, it's going to be a battle just just to get the six wins and get bowl eligible because they, they got some very difficult road tests coming up here in the SEC. And you know, and this this game against UCF, I think before the season, I think a lot of people probably treated that game as a sort of a, a throwaway game, an easy home win. But the, the way that but the way the Gamecocks have performed through the first three games, uh, I don't think it's going to be any easy win. Uh, I think the UCF's going to probably going to come in there. And I know UCF has a lot of problems as well too, um, but. Uh, uh, that game could end up very well being a being a fourth quarter game and being a battle, and uh, and it certainly it's a game right now. That that is an absolute must win game for the Gamecocks. The way the uh, first three games have gone. South Carolina lost its starting quarterback Connor Mitch a week ago against Kentucky. Right. Then the combination of of Perry Orth and Lorenzo Nunez just ten of twenty two for eighty four yards versus Georgia. Right. Who do you think starts this week versus UCF? Well, I, I said last night I think that uh, they should go ahead and start uh, Lorenzo Nunez at quarterback. I think he's a, he's a dual threat guy. I think uh, you know I think Curry Orth has, has been a loyal soldier for three years here within the program. But uh, I think you got to go with the uh, go with the true freshman and and then just see what he can do and get him some experience. Now he played most of the second half uh, last night in, in Athens and, uh, and did did pretty well in spots. You know, he ran the ball pretty well. And, Threw the ball well a couple of times, so but of course he had the usual, you know, true freshman type jitters and then the true freshman problems, and and he certainly hasn't mastered the entire playbook yet. Uh, but certainly, um, I think you just you just bite the bullet and uh, and let Lorenzo Nunez start and, and let him play the entire game and just see how he does. Do you expect to see more of a run game, a ground game, especially with running backs, with the questions at the quarterback spot? Uh, yes. Uh, Brandon Wiles, who's, who came into the year as the number one rusher, though, was, was hurt last night. So we'll have to find out his status as we go through the week. Uh, but they have some decent running back. Between, between Nunez running the ball and Sean Carson and David Williams, even if Wiles is, is unable to play, with a, I think he had a uh, hip injury, 
and last night. So we'll have to see. Uh, we'll, we'll, ha- we'll have to see how, how that goes. But certainly, the Gamecocks have the ability to run the football. I think they have. They, have, they came into the season with three very good running backs, three SEC caliber running backs that can all that all contribute in different ways and all the different skill sets. Um, so I will certainly look for if Nunez starts. I would look for Nunez, Sean Carson, Dave Williams to uh, to run the ball a significant amount if Brandon Wallace can, cannot play. And if Wallace can, and the Wallace plays, then I think the, I think the run pass ratio goes even higher in favor of the run because I think uh, I think that with all, with all the problems of having the passing game right now, really no one has really stepped up to help support uh, Farrell Cooper right now through three games. So I think I, I can certainly envision this game where the Gamecocks. Are uh, stick, stick the ball on the ground and, and, and stay there for the entire 60 minutes. Defensively, Georgia had its way through the air and on the ground. Scott, nothing seemed to go right on the defensive uh, side of the ball for the Gamecocks. Right. No, I, it, it did not. Um, uh, like I said, the, the Fed, Fed the same problems uh, uh, as, as last year. The changes that John Holt brought, you no, know, he, he came in, he, his first task was to simplify the defense, uh, make it easy for the players to, just to, to react. And, and 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 play fast as opposed to thinking too much out on the field. He, he brought he, he brought a, a very simple four three scheme Tampa two type system to Columbia. But right now things are just uh, right now the players are just having a difficult time adjusting to it because uh, they can't uh, they have a difficult time stopping anybody and uh, especially on the ground. You know last year the Achilles heel last year was, was sort of was sort of uh, two pronged. One they couldn't they they couldn't put any pressure on the, on the opposing quarterbacks and two they couldn't stop the run. And as, as you know that's a pretty lethal combination. And and, uh, and this year, those two same problems are cropping up again. So, um, unless they get those two those two problems fixed, uh, they're going to continue to struggle on defense. And 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 maybe the Saturday against a I guess a struggling UCF team might be the tonic the Gamecocks need. Uh, but we'll find out because uh, the way this team's going right now, you know, I think the confidence is, is pretty low right now. Um, so we'll see how we'll see how it goes on Saturday at noontime. It sounds a lot like both of our teams have you know a lot of things in common as far as the struggles. UCF's rough start has fans clamoring for a change at the top. They want George O'Leary out. Rumblings right. seem to surround Steve Spurrier as well. What's the lay of the land in Columbia about how the old ball coach's future holds? Well, I, I don't think there's a massive outcry yet for, to remove Spurrier. You know, you, you, you certainly have your vocal minority on the message boards and, and Twitter and Facebook and all those social media sites. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but I, I think, uh, no, I think Spurrier came back this year because he wants, he wants to improve things. He so he hired his buddy Holt from his Florida days. Um, we'll see. I, I think I think whether this is Spurrier's last season or not will be lots dictated by the, how the, 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 these next nine games go. Now, they got some difficult games. They got to play on the road at A and M. They got to go to Tennessee. Um, they got to go to Missouri. They got LSU at home, and they got Clemson at home. So those are those are very, very, very difficult games. And they got to win one of these, those one or two of those games. They want to go. They want to go bowling. In fact, they get the, they get the Gators at home too in November. So um, it is going to be a tough road ahead just to get to the six wins to get to get bowl eligible. Um, if now Spring has never had a losing record in his head coaching career. If they finish five and seven, does Steve Spring want to want to end his coaching career with a with a losing record? You know, I doubt it. I would think that if that happened, that Spurrier would probably want to come back next year and 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 and, and with a behind Nunez, a quarterback or somebody else, and and uh, revamp offense and and see how it goes. But uh, um, and so certainly that, that's Steve Spurrier's call too. Now the U.S. South Carolina is not going to fire Steve Spurrier. Ray Tanner, the, the AD here, it's not going. To, it's not going to fire Steve Spurrier. Uh, it's going to be. It's, it's, they've said all along the last couple of years that that's going to be Steve Spurrier's call. He's done too much here for the school. The three straight 11 win seasons, all the bowl games, all the bowl trips down to Orlando and Tampa and, and different places down in Florida. So um, Steve Spurrier will leave when he thinks it's the right time. And I got to think that if they have a losing record this year, that he would think that's not the right time to go because he doesn't want to leave on a sour note. Yeah, I think it's it's pretty much the same situation here to be honest with you thank you so yeah. much for joining us i really appreciate it good luck to the gamecocks and the game uh on saturday and we hope to at least see a good game as far as i'm concerned yeah, thanks we'll see all the ucf folks up, up here in columbia on saturday thank you so you travel a lot for work and fun have you ever thought about having just a little bit more insurance travel x gives you the peace of mind so you can take care of your family and loved ones Click the link on our webpage. I'm just saying, accidents happen.
This is Cameron Stewart, class of 2015 receiver, and you're listening to the UCF Nightline broadcast. Welcome to Inside the Huddle with former UCF quarterback Kyle Israel, brought to you by the Little Greek Fresh Grill. Fresh, flavorful, fabulous water for lakes, 855 North Alfea Trail, Orlando. All right, Kyle, welcome back. There's nothing, I don't even know what to say about this week. Last week I came in and said, where do we go from here? I don't want to say that again, but we're back in the same situation. The situation is even worse as far as I'm concerned. Well, I think that it's it's certainly looking back on the time that I followed UCF football, which was probably in the early part of my recruiting process in 2002. You know, this is probably one of the more... Uh, disappointing losses, if not the most disappointing loss uh, in in recent memory, just based on the fact of where our program has ascended to, and and being the number ten team in the country two years ago with a Fiesta Bowl win, then not being able to pull off the home game against Furman, uh, only two years removed from that, I think it's uh, certainly one of the most difficult games to swallow. And I've been on some lopsided excited games. My senior year, we lost at South Florida, I believe, six. 4-12. to 12. I was a true freshman when we went 0-11 in 2004. Um, so I've seen some tough games and I've been a part of some tough losses, but um, this one is right up there when you consider you know, like I said, where we where we are as a program today um, and the type of football that we should be playing, even considering the injury bug that we've had this season uh and the loss of all those receivers last year and some DBs, I think that this game is still a game you should never really uh, think could potentially be a loss. Speaking of injuries, we talked about this last week. I've mentioned this weeks and weeks and weeks in, in a row on the show. Jordan Akins going out on the, you know, the, the very first kick return of the game, very first play of the game, goes out. It looks like, to me, a devastating knee injury. I I don't know if you've seen the replay of that, but his uh, knee went the other direction, and it's not supposed to go that direction. I just feel I like that was a horrible mistake to put one of your best players back there and, and put him in that situation. Did it hurt anything? Yeah, I, Did it help anything? I don't know. You know, I mean, obviously it's going to take him out. It could take him out for the rest of the year. It could honestly end his career. That I think it's going to be a devastating knee injury, and I don't know. I haven't heard anything besides that. But I don't know that we're truly going to get a defining uh, explanation in regards to what the injury is. It looked really, really bad. Uh, I obviously feel really bad for Jordan Aiken. That's so bad for the team because you know Justin Holman is not a vocal leader. Uh, he's not. He's more of a lead by example, and, and we'll get into that later in this. Uh, in, in my segment in regards to uh, me watching Justin on the sideline last night. But Jordan Akins is a guy that's certainly a leader for the football team. You know, I, I don't I don't necessarily have as much of a problem as I think you do in regards to him being back there returning kicks. Um, because when you look at guys that are, that are skilled position players that can make plays for us, I'm not sure that a uh, coach is as comfortable with people returning kicks um, as with Jordan. And so... Yes, are you putting a maybe one of our best players at risk? Certainly. Um, does he give us a good opportunity to get good field position? I think so. So it's just one of those things in football. You know, we're not privy to uh, see what's going on in practice in regards to the kick return game. Are there any? Is there anybody else that can be back there? I would like to think that if you're not going to use Will stand back at all at running back, why don't you have him back there at least returning kicks? But you know, it's uh, end, of the, end of the story is it's just really, really unfortunate that you lose him on the first play of the game. I think he's the type of player that changes the ball game. Certainly a safety net for a guy like Bo Schneider or Tyler Harris going into a game plan knowing that you have a, a big receiver like him out wide for you that you can really rely on to be in the right place at the right time. And when you look at our wide receiver core when Justin was out of it, I mean, I don't even know who was on the field, honestly. Number 12, our leading receiver, I think he was a scout team fullback at some point this season and he was one of our better receivers yesterday. We have a Jordan Franks out there with a cast on his arm playing wide receiver. I mean, I, 
I don't know what else to say, but it, it's just really unfortunate that we lose uh, Aikens uh, in the manner that we did. And I don't, I don't expect to probably see him back this season just based off the way that that injury looks. Yeah, I mean, it could be completely different. We could be wrong. It, you know, maybe it just got strained or, or sprained or whatever. But I've been around football for a long time, and, and that it's never good when your knee goes that direction. So we'll see, and no. hopefully he comes back, and hopefully he'll have a great career, you know, past this. I just, you know, it's it's very unfortunate, like you said. Considering the silver lining with Jordan Aikens, I believe that a medical redshirt for a season, you can still apply for one for that given season. Uh, at the end of your career, if it happens in the first three games, which it did. So um, he may be a guy that could get a um, medical red shirt, uh, potentially, um, you know, you apply for that at the end of your career. But that may be, that may ultimately mean that in a season that means more to this program than does, does this one so far, uh, we may have a guy like uh, Jordan Aikens here for a little bit longer. Okay, I understand. Yeah, we were kind of, discussing that last week as well we weren't sure you know if Holman would be back either they say that he's going to be back you know uh, two two to four weeks he gets the stitches out of his hand this week I guess and you know I don't know it's going to take a lot to grip the ball I think but anyway that's a that's kind of a different story do you see any positives that came out of yesterday and were you shocked at all by what you saw like the rest of us were shock wise yes extremely shocked I mean Furman is a school of 2,500 students we're a school of 60,000. We just won a BCS bowl game two years ago. I'm extremely shocked. And, I'm, and, 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 you know, a lot of people are looking at the coaching staff, and I certainly think that the staff is, is part of the issue uh, yesterday. But this, this team just, just seems to not have any enthusiasm. It seems just disgustingly soft uh, in a lot of areas. And, and I hate saying that because I'm a guy that's always going to support the program, always going to uh, – you know, want to say as many positive things as I can about the school and had a great experience myself, but I just got to call it for what it is when I'm being asked these questions. And I, you know, I'm just disappointed with the players. We don't have any leadership. It's very, very blatantly obvious that we don't have any leadership, especially when we only have nine seniors. Uh, there's not really buddy there to step up, uh, in my opinion. You certainly don't see that on the field. Um, and, and leaders can be seen, and, and we've seen it in the past. Uh, you know, with guys, and I just don't see that with this football team at all. And that's that's glaringly obvious to me. Uh, and number two, it's 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 a shock. So that's what's the most shocking thing is any type of leadership with the players, the softness of our football team at this point. Offensive line, um, defensive line plays good in spots, but they should against the one double A offensive line, the one double A opponent. Um, that should be expected. And and I think just. The lack of taking care of the football, quarterbacks, quarterbacks uh, throwing, throwing ill-advised interceptions. I know you're young. I'm not so upset with Bo's interception. They were playing cover six. Sometimes it looks like they're playing quarters coverage, but you know, to the boundary. That means the cover six is basically basically cover two to the boundary in quarters coverage to the field. That can be hard to. Uh, see early on in your career, safeties can disguise that a little bit better. I think he just throws that one up into coverage, and he'll learn from that one. Tyler Harris, certainly the last interception was very ill-advised in a crucial part of the game where we couldn't afford that. Uh, and he's not a true freshman. He's a redshirt freshman. He's been around here uh, a little while now. So I- I'm just – I'm. You know, those turnover, C.J. Wilson's fumble, it wasn't even like it was a big hit. It basically fumbled from hitting the back of one of our own players. So I think I'm just shocked a little bit at, at the, the lack of ball security offensively and really just shocked at the lack of play-calling creativity. Uh, I, I know that our hands are tied a little bit. Okay, let's be, let's be honest about the situation. But, you know, we're not – no screens – uh, no double moves by the wide receivers on the outside where you got two young quarterbacks that certainly have the arm strength to get the ball down the field. And, you know, we're running short hitches, deep hitches, but then, you know, what do you, how can you, how can you utilize those routes? Well, you bring DBs up all game and then you take a double move shot down the field. None of that. Um, a lot of power runs right into the line of scrimmage. I mean, just thought that there would be more creativity when you have a full week to prepare for a team like Furman. Um, and really a little bit shocked at the way that the quarterbacks are managed. So, yeah, shocking. Positive. We had a good crowd <laughs> for a Furman game. I thought the fan base did a good job of, of supporting. I mean, there were certainly some, some bare spots in the stadium, but when you have a deluge, 
like we did a couple hours prior to the game, and then we're playing Furman, and you know, we I, I know that the fans should always be there supporting, but I thought we had a pretty decent crowd yesterday, uh, all things considered. That's certainly a positive. Uh, it wasn't a conference game, I guess, uh, with a positive, but I don't know that you can take too many positives from that, honestly. Yeah, I, I don't know. I agree. Let's talk a little bit more about the quarterback play. Last week, we talked about Stanford and how we planned for, we basically planned for for four quarterbacks to be used in that game. Didn't plan, but that's basically what happened. Clearly, three were the game plan for this week. I expected to see Patty for a couple of plays, you know, in that wild night or whatever we call it. I expected that, but I didn't expect, it was like a circus in a way. I mean, there was, you know, this quarterback out there, then Patty, then that quarterback out there, then Patty. I I just, and I understand they're looking to see what they have with these guys, but is a game the right time to see what they have for these guys, or is practice the right time to to figure out what's going on? I think it's a little bit of both on some level. I I think that if you're going to decide that Bo Schneider is the guy at least to to go into the game, then let him make some mistakes. You know, he's a true freshman. He's going to make a few mistakes. And and then, you know, I I, I did like what we were doing with Nick Patty. I mean, it was clearly successful. We had like a 13-play drive, went down, scored. Next drive, I think we drove all the way down to the three-yard line. Unfortunately, we get a holding penalty, which really hurt us. We weren't able to get in the end zone on that drive after we ran all the way down to the three. But just just rotating quarterbacks in the way that we did. And then, you know, Tyler Harris just never had it yesterday. And we go with him in the most crucial part of the game when we really need it. I don't quite get it. I don't think that we were giving these guys an opportunity to be successful really with, with play design and then play calling. And our hands are probably tied a little bit. I know that Coach Barrett during the week, who I think is a, a fantastic coach and certainly good with quarterbacks and has been in the past working with Blake Bortles, with Coach Taff, and helping him develop and helping develop Justin. Um, but he works with the special teams a lot within our program. And I know that a lot of the quarterbacks are then spending time with Coach Key whenever there's anything going on with special teams. So, it would be great to to see us choose one guy and live or die uh, with with him because at this point you're you're zero and three you're still trying to figure out who's going to be your guy going into the conference play and when you're playing two quarterbacks that are struggling you might as well just play with one let him struggle but let him learn because if if a quarterback's looking over his shoulders especially a young guy which they both are it can be very difficult mentally. You know, it can be very difficult to get any type of confidence. And, I, and, I've, and I've been in that situation myself with UCF. Sometimes I put myself in that situation. I'd be naive to think that I didn't. However, it still makes it very difficult for quarterbacks. So it was just this strange rotation that I, you know, it didn't have any rhyme or rhythm. It seemed like that you could tell that there was a reason for doing it. But, I mean, there are plays that we could be running to help these guys out a little bit more. And it seems like we're running things that are so basic that, you know, teams can defend it easily. Do you think that the running backs can't catch out of the backfield? Is, could that be an issue? Or are those guys not capable of, of making the screen passes and stuff like that? They shouldn't, they shouldn't be on the field. I mean, how many – you've played high school football. There's first and second second string running backs in high school football that can catch passes out of the backfield. I mean, that's, that's certainly not the reason. I mean, there's, there's screen games that we've had in the Charlie Sapp offense that worked for us over the past couple of years. The the inside rocket screen where the outside receiver's coming in over the middle, catching it, turning up field behind blocking from the offensive line. Right. Um, you know, there's a misdirection screen where we have the back swinging out to the right. If the defensive end comes towards the quarterback, we dump it off to the, the running back. If the defensive end works up the field with the running back, we turn back the other way, and there's a wide receiver working on the backside in on the screen. That's, that's a double screen that I've seen us use in the past. Did not see that at all. Um, a basic screen, even. Uh, you know, I, I just think so we're, we're, we don't really, there's a little bit of creativity that can, that can, we can use that I just don't see used. And, you know, I, I'll say it here publicly, I, I, I try to be a little bit careful about what I say because the, this program, uh, is so close knit and, you know, really frowns on former players going on social media and message boards and doing, con- having conversations like this. And I've been quote unquote reprimanded in the past for, for not being in line with positive comments in regards to the program. Now I've done a bunch of radio and, and other things and sometimes that has to happen. I would never say anything about a coach's job 
in regards to whether they should be fired or anything like that. But I will say that I, I just think of what we've seen is, is not the, not giving our, our players the best opportunity to win. Certainly not last night. I agree a hundred percent. I don't want to like, you know, sit here and dog coaches and players and everything else. We're just analyzing the game. I really try to keep it pretty positive, but I also think that the fans deserve, you know, to hear what's really going on, maybe from an insider's view. So that's why, mm-hmm. you know, we we like to talk about stuff, and, and sometimes we we may say things that they not be may not be happy with, but. If we weren't, if if we we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we said everything to make UCF happy, and that's right. that's my stance on it. So, do you think that that the wild night thing was overutilized? I know it worked a little bit. Do you think maybe they should have abandoned it after they used it a couple times and maybe brought it back? You know, a little bit later on in the game. I think that my thought was if you were going to utilize it, then create part of the game plan around it. We ran on just a lot of power with it, where you saw. Tariq Cook pulling and Nick kind of falling through the hole, and I think that was working. Uh, we had a guy coming in motion, but our, you know, Nick Patty's a former quarterback. I mean, the guy was one of the well, was in the Elite Eleven television show. Uh, he was a, a quarterback that was recruited by Boise State and committed to Boise State. You know, when Boise State was were world beaters. Uh, I mean, I, he can throw the football. Now I know he hasn't been throwing the football at practice because they moved him to wide receiver. But I think that if you're going to use the wild night, then run plays off there. Run this direction where you got the guy coming in motion, Nick fakes that he's going to run the power and then boots back out and use the hit our tight end or a guy coming across, uh, coming across the, the formation. Um, run stuff off of it if we're going to use it like, like we did, which was quite a bit. So I think that it was successful when we used it. I think it, it helped us move the football. I think it took some pressure, uh, you know, off the young quarterbacks and, um, you know, took some pressure off of the running backs that are, that are both young, obviously. So I don't think that it was – I think it certainly helped the game plan, um, but I think there was a little bit more, actually, that we probably could have done with it, in my opinion. Uh, and then maybe Mitch Patty is a guy that we need to consider as the guy that can be the backup or shouldn't be the backup quarterback uh, in there. I mean, obviously, if you're just – Bo Schneider's redshirt's obviously gone. And I think that, that you probably want to try to see who can be the quarterback going into conference play, is, is my opinion now. Now we're going to go up to a hostile environment again up in Columbia, and I think that we're going to have to use the, utilize the wild night. But, uh, you know, Nick Patty looked good yesterday versus Furman, but he's not the most fleet of foot type of guy, especially when you're going up against an SEC defense. Not a great one in South Carolina, but SEC athlete. So, I'm interested to see what our game plan is going to be for next week, but I think that the wild night was good for us. I just think we probably could have done more with it, to be honest. If you think about it, it's supposed to be a thing that the defense sees when you throw a different quarterback in there, and they're, it's supposed to kind of make them panic and, and you know not know what to do. That's the whole point of it. So if you throw it in sparingly by surprise, it works great. I just don't think it can work all the time like that. Um, right. It seemed like Taj McGowan and CJ had their moments, you know, a couple times on the ground, a couple of wide receiver heads some plays. Noticeably, a guy named Blake Tarasi, I think. I, I'm not sure how to say it. And Jordan Franks. The team o- has only scored 36 points through three games. Where does the offense go? I mean, what where, what do we have to do to make that work? Well, I, I mean, I certainly think that we need to find a way to get the ball in uh, our our wide receivers' hands. In space, whether that's through, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the screen game, or uh, on even like a slant route, or deep comebacks. I mean, we we throw a lot of these. You know, I'm sure the team probably calls them Houston. We used to call them Tennessee back in the day. But you got like the five to seven yard hitch, and the seven to five yard hitch, and the ten to twelve yard hitch. I mean, teams just start sitting on those things. So Traquan Smith trying to get the ball to him in space, uh, using the screen game. Um, you know, and then just, we don't have anything to lose at this point right now, right? We're 0-3, we just lost to Berman. I, I think that you want to possess the ball as much as possible and eat up as much clock as you can going into South Carolina. We really need to make the game shorter if you're not going to be able to score points. So that's something to consider. But I, I think we, we should we should try and take some shots uh, down the football field. I know that Bo and Tyler can deliver the ball down the field, 
But, you know, when, when, when I mentioned earlier, teams playing this cover six coverage, for example, half the field, uh, cover two to the boundary, quarters to the field. I mean, when, when that coverage is out there, that strong safety is in a bind. He's usually at about eight to 10 yards, 12 yards at, at the most. And when you have two receivers, wide receivers split out, you can run a scissors route, put him in a bind there, run, which is a post over the top and a corner route underneath by the slot. The safety has to choose. Am I going to drop back and go with the post route, or am I going to run with this corner route? If he runs with the corner route, you should have the post over the top one-on-one with the cornerback. If he goes with uh, the post route, then you got to read the corner. Does he come off of the post route? or And then you can check it down underneath that. Or you can run a, a post by the outside receiver and a dig by the slot. Does the, cor- does the safety drop deep underneath the post, or does he come up on the dig? If he comes up on the dig, hit the post. If he drops back under the post, hit the dig. I mean, you really, I think you really need to isolate some of these safeties, especially with these teams that are playing quarter coverage. And I didn't see us do that last night. Uh, instead, you know, we may have called that play, but Bo chose to go backside and throw it into coverage. So I think just there's one thing. Often the coordinators have to do two things, right? they got to design a game plan, and they have to create a game plan based on what the other team does. And that's in a film room that's on a whiteboard during the course of a week, putting a game plan together. The next aspect of an offensive coordinator's job is executing and calling plays in the moment during a game when the pressure is on. And Brent T, for the most part, doesn't have any experience doing that. And that is some, that's an area he's going to have to gain experience, uh, you know, as an offensive coordinator. So, sure, somebody can game plan all week and sit in there and, 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 and really try to put a true game plan together, but then you've got to go and execute it just like a player has to execute the play. Coordinator's got to execute the call. And so I, I hope that we can we can just get a little bit better as far as creativity and play calling inside the game based on what other defenses are doing to us. And, and those are just some of the small things that I saw yesterday, just, you know, naked eye, sitting in the stands, you know, based on what the defense has given us, these are some plays that we could, could use. And, you know, we have smart coaches in there. Let's not forget that. Danny Barrett, Coach Beckton, Coach T has been around the game a long time. If you think Charlie Caff, who still lives in Orlando, isn't walking the halls of that football office, you're probably naive. Uh, you know, hopefully we, we can, you know, I, I think that he's a guy that we could lean on, although he is retired at this point in time. If I'm Brent Key, I'd be having a phone call with Charlie Tapp just to, just because help isn't bad. You know, it's not, it's not a bad thing to ask for help. I'd be buying him dinner for like all week. Be like, please help me at this point. <laughs> well, Charlie's a part of the broadcast crew. You know, he's doing the games up there with Mark Daniels. But, uh, you know, he's still here in Central Florida, and I, I know that Coach Taft really still loves this program. I think he's a great offensive coordinator for us. I don't think he gets as much credit as he has deserved to get, really, for what he's done in his time here at UCF. Just really utilized our talent very well over the last couple of years. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a camera in that football facility that you may see Charlie Taft walking those halls last couple of weeks and the weeks to come just to just to just to help out just to help out as far as quarterbacks go in a george o'leary led team mm-hmm. how much room is there out there for creativity on the field is there when the play call comes in is there of course there's probably multiple check downs and things like that multiple things that can happen out of the set how much freedom does a quarterback have though to to make those choices or is it just you know you're throwing it to this guy well, it depends on the quarterback. You know, when Blake Bortles was in there, I'm sure there were a lot of options for him from the run game, getting us in and out of good looks in regards to what was thematically best defense for us to run the ball against, uh, taking opportunities to check into a pass play when, when, when they were stacking the box. I mean, it really depends quarterback to quarterback. I know when I was playing, we obviously had Kevin Smith and one of the better offensive lines in the country. And we had multiple run plays called a line of scrimmage. Now, people over the years have said, God, you're just a game manager. You turn around and hand the ball off to Kevin Smith. I have no problem with that because we won football games. But what you don't know is that when I was turning around and handing the ball off, there was a sequence of four or five plays that I was trying to decide on at the line of scrimmage is what is the most advantageous running play we can call right now. And that aspect of the game, you just cannot see with the naked eye. To us, it looks like you get a play, you turn around, you hand the ball off. Well, there's a whole decision-making process prior to the snap of the football that has to take place, and the quarterback has to know what he's looking at and has to know the game plan and has to know the defense to give us the best opportunity to run into a front where we have the numbers. So it just depends quarterback to quarterback from, like, audibling. 
But when, when you're talking about scrambling around and trying to make things happen, I, I, it just depends on the guy. I know when you're really young, Coach, you know, I think Coach wants you to, to do exactly what is called, and there's probably not a lot of flexibility for changing plays or, or uh, those type of things. But the thing that's not happening right now is I don't think that there's been any, you know, continuity established between the quarterbacks and the wide receivers. And obviously Justin was the guy, and he was the court starter in camp, and there seemed to be some continuity there when he was playing, especially between him and Aikens. But right now, there just hasn't been a time for continuity to be established between Bo, Tyler, and the wide receivers. And as long as we're just rotating quarterbacks in and out, that, that's going to be hard to establish. So even if you look back all the way back to Joe Hamilton days at Georgia Tech, the George Godsey days at Georgia Tech, I mean, Coach very coaches the quarterback like he does any other position. If you're not getting the job done, there's a chance you're coming out of the football game. Would I coach like that? No, I wouldn't. But that's how he's chosen to coach, and he's been successful doing it. But it definitely puts more pressure uh, on the guy that's in the game because you know that if you don't convert here, you may be coming out of the game. If you don't score a touchdown, you may be coming out of the game. And sometimes I think that causes guys to force the football. But Coach Larry, you know, he's he's never going to be an easy guy to play for from a quarterback perspective. But that's just his style, and I and I don't ha- I respect that. I really do. I really do. I think that there's times when it really works because sometimes the quarterback needs to get on the sideline, see the game from a different perspective, and then you can get back in there uh, and make those adjustments and feel a little bit more comfortable than maybe you have been before you came out. However, um, you know, the rotating of quarterbacks like we're seeing now. I don't know if it's ever going to give any of those guys a chance to be successful. You talked a little bit earlier. You mentioned Justin Holman and his activities on the sideline while he's injured, and there mm-hmm. there being like kind of a lack of a of a leader on this team. Is that a thing that he could do while he's on that sideline? Is be a well, leader I, still? You would hope so. I mean, I don't know Justin personally. I'm sure he's a great guy. I know that he works really, really hard, from what I've heard. And, uh, you know, guys look at him as a leader on this football team. And I was, you know, I just found it interesting. Not that it was right or wrong at all. I just found it interesting that when, you know, he was kind of standing on the 50 yard line most of the game and, and wasn't over there with the backup quarterback and with Coach Barrett and Coach Beckman were, you know, signals were going into the game. I figured that he would be over there kind of in the ear of whichever quarterback wasn't in the game, uh, explaining to them maybe the reads or, uh, trying to give them some confidence. I think, you know, he's the starting quarterback for this football team. I don't think he needs to be concerned that when he's healthy, there's any chance that he won't be the guy. So I would have just, you know, I would have thought just, just you know, watching from the stands that I would have seen him there with Tyler and with Bo kind of on the sideline during the offensive series, you know, really engaged maybe. And I, I didn't feel like I didn't see him very engaged. Now, I don't know what he's been going through during the week. Maybe he spent a lot of time in the athletic trainer's room. Maybe he wasn't very involved in the game plan because there was we knew he wasn't going to play. I, I just thought you may see him more actively involved with whichever quarterback wasn't in the game at the time uh, and maybe talking to some wide receivers more and, and help them that way. So that's just a, a perspective from the stands. I could be completely off base in that comment. That's just what I call I watch the stands a lot from where I sit as well. I'm only about maybe eight rows up behind the bench of of UCF. And I watch the sideline probably 50% of the time when the game's going on, to be honest with you. I I like to see the interactions between people. I like to see if O'Leary yells at people when they come off or or somebody yells at him or somebody pats him on the back or, or whatever. I like to see that interaction because I was a part of that interaction when I played as well. It seems like I watched Tyler and Bo a lot the other day and Justin Holman as well. It seemed like that Tyler and Bo work really well together on that sideline and they were the first ones to come up to the other one, of course, and you know, and give positive or negative feedback or whatever they were saying. We can, we will never know what they say, but I thought that that was good. At least those two guys are sticking together. They're not, you know, making a big deal out of this, you know, and, and they're definitely teammates and in support of each other, no matter what happens. Mm-hmm. Defensively, there were some breakdowns time to time. But UCF did hold Furman to 16 points and 270 yards. It's hard to pin the loss on the defense. What did you see from the defense? Did you see anything positive, anything negative? What were your comments on that? 
I, I think that there were times in the game where we certainly did a good job of getting pressure on the quarterback, and obviously we expected our defensive line to be the strength of our team. I, I mean, the touchdown that Furman scored late in the game was basically a double move on the outside where our corner, our corner bit, and uh, you know they had a number three got over the top Furman and was able to score. I would love to see us utilize some play calls like that. Maybe we, we have them called and we're just not executing them. Hard to watch every position on the field, but you know I think that our our defense you know played fairly well. Uh, you know you gave up 16 points. You certainly didn't get a lot of help you know offensively, and I, I certainly don't think that's the weakness of our team right now. Right? I, I think that you know there's always room for improvement. There's a lot of a lot of younger guys running around there, especially in the defensive backfield. We're trying to figure out who who those guys are going to be for us moving forward as we get into conference play. But it. it you know, when the offense isn't doing anything, it, it really puts a different type of pressure on your defense. And you've got to really give credit to Furman. I mean, at some point you got to give them credit. The guy goes in there and kicks a, a field goal that would have been good from 60 yards. Uh, Absolutely. That was amazing, I mean, actually. I mean, I almost just wanted to applaud the guy because, you know, you're, you know, not the conference, you know, what level of football you play, it matters, but you're a one double A kicker and go out there in a pressure situation on the road and you just absolutely drill. A 55 a yarder. 55 yarder, yeah. uh, that ends up being the difference in the ball game. Got to give their special teams some credit there and that kicker, uh, for doing that. But other than that, I mean, you know, defense plays well. You almost think that they're probably going to punt in that situation. They end up kicking the field goal, and it's good. But I don't, you know, I don't have as much problem with the defense. I think that we're going to see some guys continue to step up. I think we still could establish a line of scrimmage a little bit better. Sometimes I think we're playing the edge uh, a little bit soft. Uh, teams seem to try to be getting the ball on the outside. And, and uh, you know, when we needed a, a stop there at the end of the game, we got to stop. And, and the ball was back in our offense's hands, and, and we would go, you know, I think we go three and out one time, we get the ball back, and then we turn the football over with a fumble. So I'm not as concerned about the defense. I think we'll continue to improve. I think there's some young talent on, on the team. The problem is we just don't have any really older veteran leadership. Losing a guy like Jacoby Glenn, who goes undrafted, certainly hurts. Uh, I, I would love to have him this year uh, out there at the corner position because then you can feel a little bit more comfortable with him in the man coverage. It gives you a little bit more of an opportunity to run some games and some blitzes uh, by the, you know, defensive front seven. Uh, so, so losing to Kobe so early on in his career definitely hurt. But I feel okay about the defense. A purely hypothetical question here. If you were the coach, if you were O'Leary, or if mm-hmm. you were the head coach of UCF football, what would you tell this team during the week? to try to, you know, get through the South Carolina game and to to come out with the best game possible and even possibly a win? What would you tell them? Well, I, I would certainly tell them, hey, guys, we don't have any pressure on us right now. So we, we put ourselves in a situation where uh, we have to go out there and play with a reckless abandon. We have to go out there, uh, you know, and really play, for lack of a better term, balls to the wall because uh, the effort, Coach Fred preaches two things every single day. In, in the restaurant business, I preach it to my staff as well. Two things I expect from you, effort and enthusiasm. And I think that needs to be more evident than ever, effort and enthusiasm. We have to bring that to the practice field every day. We can't get down on ourselves and say, woe is me, we're 0-3. Because for the players, you know, the fan base may be writing the season off, right? We're 0-3, how many games can we win, blah, 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 blah. But for the players, they got to go out there and perform. I mean, they're on scholarship for a reason. And there's an expectation level of performance. So, you know, you know I, would be, I would be positive. I don't know if Coach O'Leary is going to take that approach. He, he probably has a little bit of a management style that's different than mine. But I would be as extremely positive as possible uh, and, and just get to work, really get to work and try to get better. We don't, we're not going to improve drastically in one week. But my message would be, hey, Let's really bring effort and enthusiasm this week. Let's understand that we have nothing to lose going on the road up to South Carolina, and we just need to get better week in and week out and realize that everything that we play for in the season in regards to conference play is still in front of us, and if we want to be successful inside of conference play, then we have to greatly improve, and we have another week ahead to do that. And let's go up to Columbia in in a hostile environment and – 
and, and give give South Carolina the best game that we possibly can. That's what I would say. I try to keep it as positive as possible. And and you, what you don't want to do is you don't want to lose these guys for the season. You don't want to lose their interest. You don't want for them to get down on themselves so much that you just can't really dig the team out of the hole. That's tough mentally for the players. That's a, it's extremely Certainly. rough. I know what that's and, like. So and you really don't want to see. You got to let this team know that this is a team game. That's offense, that's defense, and that's special teams. Because I've seen it happen. I've been a part of it. The defense is struggling, and the offense is doing well. And the offense just, just like man, we we're scoring points, but we can't win games. And the, you know, example this season, the defense is is keeping us in football games. Um, you know, we've had two losses where we've given up 16 and 15 points respectively. Basically, it was 17 nothing in the fourth quarter versus Stanford. I mean. Stanford just went and beat USC 41-31. Am I correct in stating that yesterday? I believe so. Okay, so it's not like we, we the team last week that we had seventeen that had only given up seventeen points to in the fourth quarter uh, was a slouch. I mean, so you, what you don't want is defense to start pointing fingers at the offense and saying you're the reason that that we're losing right now. Given the circumstances, you want this team to stay together as a unit uh, and really really move together as a team before any type of dissension happens and, and, and people start playing tennis inside the team meeting room, that's, that's when, when things start to get really bad. Yeah, it was 41-31 over USC, Stanford, and, and USC was ranked number six. So right. they have now been beaten by an unranked team. All right, one question I probably should have thrown in earlier. Coach O'Leary said that he's going to go with one quarterback now. He's gonna, he said this in his press conference last night. It was one of the first questions that was asked. He said that he's not going to play this, this game with the, the multiple quarterbacks. Who do you expect to see on Saturday night, Saturday afternoon, excuse me, in South Carolina? Which one do you think deserves to have that more going into next week's game? From an outsider's perspective, I think that Bo Schneider is probably the guy that I would go with. Just based off of him being the backup quarterback going into Stanford, him being the, the starting quarterback this week, I think that I think that I would go with Bo. You know, it's so hard from an outsider's perspective. He just seems to have more poise. Um, he's not completely forcing the football in, into coverage every time. Um, he had good poise on the road in the hostile environment when it mattered at Stanford. I mean, when you, I played it in South Carolina. I was there in 2005, and it's a really, really tough place to play. And Bo showed that he could handle that type of environment. I would give him the keys to the car and, and, and let him, you know, succeed by struggling and, and by learning. And when you're own three, I think that's the only way to do it. I, I expect to see a combination of Nick Patty in there with the Wild Knight. I wouldn't be at all surprised, you know, if for some reason Nick Patty came out and was the starting quarterback this upcoming week. I wouldn't be shocked at all. I don't know if that's going to happen, but, um, you know, I would go with Bo. The question for me is, how far has Pete DeNovo fallen out of the graces of this coaching staff when he just has no shot of playing? Well, know, he was the guy that started for us at Penn State to open the season last year over, over Justin Holman. I mean, have we lost so much confidence in him and the move to wide receiver position just totally taking him out of the quarterback picture? It's interesting because if you saw it in the pregame warm-ups, if, if you saw, he was out there throwing with quarterbacks. So I, mm-hmm. I, I thought, to be honest with you, that he would have been one of the people that we saw. He was out there taking reps with – there were four quarterbacks warming up. So – I I honestly thought that maybe we would see him, and it may not have been a bad idea because, like you said, he did win that starting spot at one point, and now he's just in the background as a wide receiver and really hasn't even been utilized as that, so that is pretty interesting to me. I don't think that he's ever going to get the shot this year because when you look back at the FIU game, he was, a, he was wearing a black jersey on the sideline, which was basically the scout team means he's on the scout team and not dressing. <clears throat> so he obviously, you know, they were just going to dress three quarterbacks, with Bo, Tyler, and, Ju- uh, and Justin. I-, I wouldn't expect to see him now either. I'm just making a comment that, you know, something had to, he just really wasn't who we expected him to be for him not to be even in consideration at this point in time, considering where he was, you know, 
a little over a year ago going in as the starter in Ireland against Penn State. All right, so Kyle, what do you think, has this hurt or helped our, well, it, I know it hasn't helped our situation with the Power Five, and does a season like this hurt that? Because we really had to have a good season this year. Does it? Are we messed up now with this possible expansion and, you know, going to a bigger and better conference? Does, does this really hurt it that bad? You know, I, I, I don't know enough about about the expansion, what they're considering when they're talking about expansion, these other conferences. I know this certainly hasn't helped. But I also know that there are a lot of other variables that are maybe considered that we spoke about last week, you know, location, television market, alumni size, size of the university, et cetera, and so on. Uh, our season this year certainly hasn't helped. But one thing that is going to continue to be considered for the fan base to realize is attendance and home attendance specifically. You know, despite the outcome of the football game, let's remember that the UCF football experience is tailgating and and being around family and friends. And there's only six games per year that we have the opportunity to be on campus, spending time with friends and family, tailgating, and going to a football game. Right? But it, it only comes. There's just 359 other days of the year that we don't have that opportunity. And other conferences are looking at those type of things, especially the Big 12 when it comes to attendance. So the team on the field thus far this season hasn't helped the program as a whole in regards to expansion, but the fan base can still control some of that. So let's continue to do our job. What is our job? Our job is to get in the stadium on game days. Our job is to be as loud as possible. Our job is to be as supportive of the university as possible. You may not be happy with the coaching staff at this point in time. You may not be happy with the players, but when it comes down to looking at attendance and it comes down to looking at other things, I would much rather spend the next 45 seasons of my life in the Big 12 Conference than in the American, and if there's anything that we can do to control that as fans, it's to show up at football games. So let's worry about what we can control, which is attendance, although it may be hard to watch, we can still control that. And I'm going to continue to support this program like I like we were three and zero at this point because I know it's the right thing to do. Coach O'Leary has turned seasons around. He's turned the program around. It's very tough after a loss like this, which I think again is probably the worst one I've seen since I've been following UCF. But true fans stick by their program. I'm going to continue to stick by this program, and I think that's how we can help this team when you're considering conference realignment is to help. Our attendance numbers stay where they are at that 39,000, 40,000 uh, fan mark. And, and let's, you know, let, let's remember that we only have so many opportunities per year to get out and be football fans and, and display the black and gold and, and tailgate and do all the fun things that come along with that. And, and let's keep that in mind because I certainly am. And, and, I, and I would challenge everybody, bring your friends out, although it may be difficult, although it may be, it may be embarrassing. Um, let's keep wearing and supporting the black and gold and, uh, and, and still understand that really, really good days for this program are ahead of us. Yeah, and I know as a former player as well how important that is for the players. I've played in some very, very empty stadiums, some of them being my own at home, and it's huge for the players, for the fans to be out there giving them their support. It's huge. I don't think people yeah. realize you know, what it is like to hear those cheers and, you know, even the booze sometimes, you know, and there was a little of that yesterday, unfortunately, but it's, it's huge to the players, and I think that we should support them. Anyway. It's important for the players, and it's, it's also important to consider that we are still recruiting, and there are still going to be recruits at our home games, and recruits look at a, a couple of things, but one of them is attendance, and for us to continue uh, to get better players here at UCF, one of the things they're going to look at is, is the attendance and, and, and listen to the crowd and the whole game day atmosphere and environment and drive it in the stadium and see the tailgater. Like, when you're being recruited, those are all things you consider. Uh, so so we need to keep that in mind as well, that, that there's also these young guys that we need to come and help this program in the future, and, and putting on a good atmosphere and good environment uh, is something that, that they are looking at and we need to, to be reminded of that. Absolutely, amen. Hey, what's going on at the Little Greek this week? Uh, Little Greek, things are things are going good. Um, we are going to start 
catering. We've been we've been kind of getting into it a little bit, but we're having our catering menus printed this week. Uh, I'm going to put together for the conference season a tailgating menu menu where you can come in here and pick up chicken skewers, steak skewer, lamb, salmon skewers uh, with a large grid salad. Um, so look for those tailgate menus, www.facebook.com slash littlegreekwaterford. Really want to push the catering menu, corporate events, birthday parties, uh, like I said, tailgating, uh, whatever the occasion, we'd be happy to cater it. That's uh, really what we're starting to push here. And uh, I had a couple people that have listened to the podcast come in, say hello to me, which I certainly appreciate. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the same analysis that I do on here. We can talk UCF football. The good and the bad, I'd be more than happy to do so, and we certainly appreciate the support here because I have uh, I have had some Nightline Podcast uh, listeners come in, and I do appreciate that. But again, we're just up here in Waterford Lake, around the corner from Best Buy, right down from Jeremiah's, and this is the first store of 18 that we're going to be doing here in Central Florida. So Little Greek will be coming to an area near you, uh, hopefully in the next uh, year and a half at some point, and uh, we, we again appreciate the support. Awesome. Thank you very much for joining us again. We will talk to you next week. All righty. Sounds good, Andrew. Appreciate it. So, you know what they say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We don't need to know about your fun-filled weekend in the city of sin, but we hope you'll click the ad on our website. It's right there to the left, the one that screams you have to save up to 50% off your next trip to Vegas. Just click on the ad and we promise never to talk about what happened in Vegas. This is UCF linebacker Terrence Plummer, and you are listening to UCF Nightline Podcast. Well, a rough weekend for the American against the Power 5 teams. Uh, after three weeks, the American now 3-10 and 10 against the P5. Perhaps the best win of the week, uh, Navy opened up the American slate. 45-21 win at home over East Carolina. Other winners, uh, Memphis went to 3-0. and Close, though. 44-41 over Bowling Green. Temple also 3-0. Took a last-second field goal, though, at UMass. They won uh, their 25-23. Cincinnati rallied back, beats Miami of Ohio 37-33. And Tulane. By the way, Tulane has a win. Uh, They beat an FCS. And we can't even beat an FCS. (laughs) Tulane won 38-7 over Maine. Uh, Worst loss of the week, no doubt. UCF wins that again. Uh, But, um, you know, we've scored 36 points in three games. Take a look at some of the scores. Number 16, Oklahoma beat Tulsa 52-38. They put 38 up against Tulsa. So in one game. Tulsa equaled, put 38 up against Oklahoma. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another high-scoring one, number three, TCU beats SMU 56-37. By the way, that's 37 points in a loss. Okay. You know, you looked at the UConn game after that mess last year, and you said, there's a win at home. They lost at number num- uh, number 22, Mizzou. Of the SEC, nine to six, led at halftime, six so, to two, and uh, who I thought might have been the best chance for a win against a Power Five team, uh, uh, South Florida went to Maryland, um, and the uh, Terps beat the Cows, thirty-five seventeen. So next week uh, doesn't look good for the chances for uh, beating a Power Five team. Vatech travels to East Carolina, and of course UCF at South Carolina. Doesn't look good there. It's not going to be good. Navy, uh, wow. They're, you know, that could be a, That's a they good could, program. They could definitely be a contender in the American. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, if, yeah. <laughs> it's, definitely. They uh, run a completely different thing than any of the other teams, really, pretty much in, in all of college football, really. I don't mm-hmm. know a lot of people that run an option like that with the quarterback all the time. that they have. Yeah, it's, all the time. It's constant and it's. It's crazy. You better be prepared when you play Navy. One to watch this week, uh, AAC game. Cincinnati at Memphis, ESPN Thursday night. Well, that could be a good game, you know? Definitely, definitely. I don't know. It's just, I, I, I'm kind of speechless. You know, there were comments. I tried to stay off the, uh, the message boards reading them because I need, I need to find uh, a way to cope with a loss and getting into the message boards is just a little bit too much 24 hours afterwards for me. But I'm going to the South Carolina game. And I said to my friend yesterday at the game, I go, you know, we could put the tickets on StubHub and everything else is cancelable. So we won't be out a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. I, I th- so, there's quite a few people on here that, that I think have said that they're, in fact, when I was walking out, like I'm selling my tickets is what, you know, a lot of people were saying, I'm, I'm not going to South Carolina. And talk um, about a glutton for punishment. I'm going to South Carolina, and then the following week to Tulane. Yeah. Ugh. Both of those will probably – I don't – honestly, I don't think that there's a, a game – playing the way that we're playing right now, 
unless something drastic happens, I don't see us winning in one game this year. It could be O oh and whatever, 12. It's hard to argue that the way they are playing now, that they can beat anybody left on the schedule, and that includes UConn and Tulane, because FIU and Furman were, were if winnable games. If this is George O'Leary's last season. He's not going out 0-12. Oh he came in 0-12, oh and, and he could go out 0-12. <laughs> oh he's not going to do that. You don't think no, so? No, no, no. Mm. No. No. Well. All right, so I we've been know. wrong for three straight weeks on uh, predictions. Well, I guess I'm going to start picking other teams because obviously UCF isn't going to win anything. So I'm not going to. I guess I'm not going to pick them to win anymore. I'll just say like my prediction will be how how uh, bad we get beat or how bad we don't. Uh, I don't know how, how bad we get beat. I guess. So what do you got for South Carolina? Yep. Oh God. Uh, they were losers, fifty-two twenty at Georgia. They're one and two. Thirty-five nothing. Thirty-five nothing. Boy, um, I'm going to go South Carolina 45, UCF 12. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, because we've scored 36 points in the first three games and we're averaging 12 points a game. No, I'll go I... back on that. Thir- thir- 35-7. 30, I- I'll say we'll score once. It'll be a fluke. It'll be like on an interception pick six or something. That, that would, I don't think the offense is going to score. I think it's, it'll be a pick six. I'm wrong all the time anyway, so this doesn't really matter. We probably shouldn't even do this on here. It's it's a joke. Well, the, that we're o, o for the season doesn't help us uh, on predictions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's kind of funny. It's it's fun to do, but nobody really knows what's going to happen out there anyway. On any given Saturday, on any given Sunday, you never know what's going to happen. Profound words. I know. I, I like that. I was thinking that when words. I said that. That's probably the most profound thing that I've That's said profound. on here. That's in a long hard. time. Oh, boy. Um, so how about our nights in the NFL? About a dozen guys saw action uh, week one. Blake with some struggles uh, in that uh, opener against how about, Carolina. How about Blake's comments? How about the comment that he made? Yeah, not wise. Well, I think it's it's kind of funny in a way. I sound like George O'Leary today. I think it's with my voice cracking. <laughs> oh, it's not good. Your nose is not nearly as red. Yeah, and the cancer on the face. Anyway, yeah, I think Blake. M- For maybe, folks who hadn't heard, yeah, uh, allude to Go that, that what, he. What did he say? He said something to the effect of comparing the fan base uh, for the Jags to kindergarten. Kindergartners kids. talking to college students, <laughs> yeah. basically. Yeah. So he called the the fans kindergartners and said that they're talking to college students because the fans don't like the play calling that's been going on there in Jacksonville. It, who are they playing today? Uh, they are playing the Miami Dolphins. Yeah, it could be fun up there. You're going to have a good time. Let's um, hope. Yeah. Uh, Get the band, at least. Yeah. Well, we already talked about that. Anyway. <laughs> uh, okay, so... I think it's maybe time for some news and notes and get just let's get out of here. Let's just get this thing over with. And now news and notes from the world of UCF sports. UCF men's golf finished seventh in a 14 school field at the Northern Collegiate in Illinois. Next up Monday and Tuesday at the Hartford Hawks Invitational in Connecticut. An invitational and intercollegiate are tough words. I know. UCF women's golf follows up a ninth place finish at the Cougar Classic in Charleston with this weekend's Mason Rudolph Championship in Tallahassee. Donning Citronach jerseys on Friday, UCF women's soccer finished the non-conference schedule with a three and one, three to one win over Georgetown. Next up, UCF back-to-back American champs opens AAC play Thursday with Temple at home. UCF men's soccer followed up a 1-0 loss at Northwestern with a 2-1 win over Grand Canyon. UCF was also wearing Foback Citronaut jerseys Friday night. Next up, men hit the road to Jacksonville Wednesday before opening AAC play Saturday night at Memphis. Junior men's tennis player Mariano Porter checked in at number 103 in the 2015 Oracle ITA Collegiate Men's Tennis Division I preseason singles rankings. Next up, the Knights open the season at the Bedford Cup at Florida Gulf Coast on September 25th. UCF Volleyball dropped to 6-6. Six and six. Non-conference play ended with losses to Seattle and Miami in the FIU invite, the lone victory. They're coming over host FIU 
Up next, UCF's AAC opener versus UConn Friday night at 7 in the venue on campus. UCF Cross Country finished 6 out of 13 Division I teams at the Mountain Dew Invitational in Gainesville. Next up, UCF competes at the FloridaRunners.com Invitational in Titusville on September 25th. All right, that's going to do it for episode number 52. I'm Andrew Fegley. And I'm Trey Strolko. Go Knights! Charge on. Victory is our cry, B-S-E-T-O-R-Y, tonight.